Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the afternoon and thank you to those who engaged in the virtual ways uh, that were made available over at lunch. Uh, th th this is a copy of the report that nine years ago the Civil Justice Council produced on access to justice um, then it said as access to justice for litigants in person we now tend to say uh, for all of those without means whether they remain litigants in person or not that was at a time when Lord uh, Newberger was the uh, head of civil justice and master of the roles uh, over the nine years since this national forum has been a feature of these sectors work facilitated by the Civil Justice Council. It's had the support of Lord Newberger's successor, Lord Dyson, and as we heard so powerfully this morning uh, from the uh, most recent uh, master of the roles, Sir Terence Etherton. We are going to be in the valuable hands of a new head of civil justice and master of the roles uh, from the beginning of next year and, and I'm speak on behalf of the whole of what will be his civil justice council in expressing gratitude that he will now address us all Sir Geoffrey Voss For the opportunity to speak today. Uh, this event has taken tremendous strides during the nine years since it began and it's now a hugely important gathering and I'm delighted to be here, albeit virtually. I want to speak today about what access to justice looks like in the modern world and what might be the components of a civil justice system fit for the 21st century. I've been thinking about these issues quite a lot lately in the run up to my new job starting at the beginning of the next legal term. And my views on these issues have been formed by essentially three matters. First, uh, civil justice as I see it is essentially regional and not in any sense London centric. Uh, secondly, there's a need to consider civil justice from the bottom up. Uh, rather than the top down, and that is extremely important. And thirdly, I do not think one can reform civil justice without listening to judges, court users, the legal advice sector, and charities operating in the county courts across the country. And as many of you will know, I have for many years been a proponent of the use of new technologies a proponent of law tech and even responsible engagement with artificial intelligence and the blockchain in the legal sector. So I want today to look at how these technologies can be employed to improve access to justice in general and access to justice for the vulnerable and those without means in particular. I hope that I will not be viewed by too many of you as a, quote, tech pusher, advocating the, quote, bright, shiny toys that we heard about this morning. As it seems to me, there are essentially three issues that underlie the creation of a genuinely forward-looking dispute resolution system. First, we should understand that justice cannot any longer be delivered according to the tried and tested methods of the 19th century. It will need to be brought online in order to meet the expectations of people of today at all levels of our society, uh, rather than the lawyers of yesterday. And secondly, we should not undertake reform by simply doing digitally what was previously analog. And thirdly, the emphasis should be on the resolution uh, rather than on the dispute. Now I'll explain in a little more detail the implications of each of these underlying principles. 
But the starting point is to look at dispute resolution holistically, knowing, as I've said often, that it extends from 60 million disputes on eBay resolved by artificial intelligence every year at the one end, to millions of family disputes about money and children, to many more millions of administrative law disputes between citizens and the state, to a range of disputes concerning employment and housing, ending up with those faced by SMEs and larger commercial entities at the very far end. They are dealt with by a variety of online platforms, ombudsmen, arbitrators, mediators, and sometimes only sometimes by courts and tribunals. It is really important to understand the range of cases that is being considered when one is looking for improvements. There is, I think, no reason whatever why there should not be a single point of online entry really for almost every dispute, however large or small, for those with or without legal representation, whether civil, family, business or administrative. The same basic data set can be created from the outset and used as the resolution process progresses. And next, there should be no assumption that every case will end up in a traditional courtroom, although of course some may. We should not have fixed ideas about the end point because that impedes the most important part of any such process, which is to bring about mediated or other satisfactory solutions. And mediated interventions should not be at a single point on the journey, but should be an integrated part of the entire process. Parties should be led culturally to expect that the process will be about achieving a resolution rather than about exacerbating or even necessarily always deciding who is right about the dispute that gave rise to the process. So let me return to my three underlying points, the online process. Now, as I see it, an online process available to all for all types of case would have an immediate and positive impact on the availability of the justice system to many more members of our society. A huge percentage of disputes that affect people's lives are not complex or even intractable. Some of course are, but we don't want a system that is tailored to the most difficult issues alone. Ultimately, the most difficult disputes will have to be dealt with by judges, working often with the party's lawyers where they're represented, either online, asynchronously, or at a series of remote hearings arising from the online process, or even in a traditional court. But we need a system, in my view, that allows the very many quite simple disputes to be resolved speedily and effectively without unnecessary cost. And if we can achieve it, it will be transformational. Much time and cost is expended on disputes of the many kinds I've mentioned. They disrupt people's private and business lives. As we've heard this morning, they affect their mental health and they're damaging to the economy. Allowing citizens speedily to vindicate their legal rights, to be paid what they're owed, to resolve their family issues and to settle whatever issues are preventing them moving forward with their lives will be a huge benefit to individuals, consumers, small businesses and SMEs alike. My vision is for an online funnel into which all the civil disputes and hopefully in time those in family and tribunals as well will be directed at the outset. The complex ones may emerge quickly to be dealt with by legacy systems such as the business and property courts or elsewhere. But the simple ones ought to be capable of quick and effective online solutions. So how do we avoid digitizing the existing process? As we've heard this morning, the awful COVID-19 pandemic has meant that many hearings can now take place remotely rather than in person. Now that's a good development, mostly. It's even better 
that so many parties and lawyers now feel comfortable using remote technologies and electronic documentation. In my view, however, remote hearings are not by themselves a long-term solution because they just allow us to undertake the same process by a technological method. The rapidly changing circumstances of our modern lives necessitate an entirely new approach to dispute resolution. Uh, those circumstances include the ready availability of the internet to the vast majority, but I understand not all, of our citizens and businesses. The massive accumulation of data about which we've heard a lot today, affecting every aspect of our working and personal lives and the availability of smart systems and artificial intelligence that can process that data and assist us in every aspect of our experience. The use of technology will grow, it will not recede. It will increasingly affect almost every aspect of what we do. And once one realizes the kind of society for which dispute resolution is going to be required in the future, it becomes obvious that it would not be sufficient just to put our existing procedures online. Instead, it's necessary over time to develop intelligent systems that can arrive at the issue in an ordinary case far more efficiently. In most cases, the issue in the case is indeed very simple. Was the car going too fast? Did John lend Mary 500 pounds? Did Usha pay the rent? Were the mortgagee, uh, mortgage instalments due? The objective in all cases must be to identify the real core issues in dispute by the quickest possible route. So I come to the point about it being for resolution rather than dispute. If every case can enter the metaphorical online funnel, it will be possible to apply online mediated interventions more efficiently at every stage in the process. The problem in our current system is that mediation is regarded as a single one-time intervention, when in reality compromise is possible in different cases at different times. An online process would allow more frequent mediated interventions tailored to the particular circumstances of each case. There needs, if possible, to be cultural change. Those with disputes with authorities, with their neighbors or in their personal and business dealings need to understand that when they enter a dispute resolution process, the objective is to achieve a resolution not to exacerbate or even always to reach for the sake of it, a judicial adjudication of that dispute. If the online process is simple, intelligible, couched in understandable language, intuitive and accessible for individuals who have no access to legal advice, it will enable issues to be resolved far more quickly than would otherwise be possible. Online resolution available for all kinds of issues across the ranges I've discussed will reduce the stress of litigation for the vulnerable and those without access to legal advice. We've heard this morning about the problems of assisting the most vulnerable in our society with their housing, mental health, debt, employment, and so many other legal and social problems. I was particularly struck by the point that was made in the first plenary session this morning about how many of the cases with which the charitable se sector is concerned raise multiple issues rather than single issues, those multiple issues being often interconnected. I am not suggesting that every vulnerable party will in practice be able, at least at an early stage in reform, to resolve every issue online. Of course not. But I think that a system that allows the bulk of claims to be processed effectively and cheaply will free up lawyers and charities to provide specific interventions for the most vulnerable and for the digitally excluded. In this context, I'd like to just make three brief observations on the recent Civil Justice Council report on vulnerable witnesses chaired 
by Judge Cotter. First, the reformed system I describe would allow the early identification of the vulnerability of a participant or a witness so that measures can be put in place to allow them to participate fully in the process. Secondly, it's notable that the Civil Procedure Rules Committee has already approved the report's recommendation to put the needs of vulnerable persons front and centre within the overriding objective to ensure that they can be put on an equal footing in all proceedings. And thirdly, an online system would be able to gather data where none currently exists as to the number of vulnerable parties and witnesses who appear before the courts to allow steps to be taken to assist them. So what conclusions can be drawn? I've only touched the surface of the opportunities offered by technology to improve the experience of the vulnerable and those without means within the justice system. What I would, however, say is that I don't think there is any real choice about whether or not to bring our justice system into the 21st century. Our present method of courthouse-based, paper-based dispute resolution is not fit for the present era. It cannot cope with the increasingly technological world in which we all live. And I believe we owe it to the generations that have grown up with technology to use our experience to fashion new online dispute resolution mechanisms that can provide what my generation never had, namely access to justice for all, for all levels of dispute. As I've said before, but I would like to emphasize now, there are three parameters on which we cannot compromise. First, the integrity of the judges and the system itself. Secondly, the imperative that any new approach to justice must command the confidence and respect of our populations. And thirdly, the quality of justice delivered. The new processes will, I believe, I hope, provide better and more accessible justice for all, whether they be individuals, consumers, families or businesses, whether they're represented or not, and whether they have means or not. Thank you. Our thanks to you, uh, Sir Geoffrey. Um, if I may be uh, uh, allowed to say to the audience that I've had the privilege of working with Sir Geoffrey in many areas over a good many years, I look forward greatly to working with him here. We all should. His remarks, his remarks show that he shares our collective view that these are important times and times of opportunity. I know he will listen. You probably picked up already that he really likes and welcomes good ideas. I'm sure you also, whether you know him or not, um, you can be sure he cares about the justice system. Our thanks to him for the address he's just given. We move now to the next uh, plenary. Um, the, um, uh, uh, this plenary is uh, led by Nick Hanning from the Civil Justice Council and uh, Martha Delaroche. Uh, they will introduce the uh, participants alongside them um, and uh, with the greatest of pleasure over I think to Martha to start. Martha. Hello thank you um, and thank you to the CJC for allowing us to be part of this session um, and a particular welcome to those of you among the delegates who are joining the session from the Justice and Innovation Group. Uh, this session will be exploring what impact technology and innovation has had and could have in the future on access to justice for those without means. Um, just some housekeeping, uh, there will be time for questions during the, the panel discussion part of the session. And a reminder that if you've got any technical queries, you can use the live support button on the top menu bar as well. 
Um, we're really pleased to be running this session as a collaborative effort. As a result, uh, the structure will be a little bit different. So we'll start with some practical updates from the front line and some demonstrations of what technology has been helping support access to justice for vulnerable people, as well as learning more about some practical opportunities for development in the future. And then we will then move on to the panel where there will be a chance to ask questions about what is needed more uh, as technology continues to develop. So just to give you a little bit of context as to kind of why the network is here and what we're doing to support, um, the LIP network is actually the development of one of the solution ideas posed by the Civil Justice Council Forum in 2015. So it's nice to be here as kind of a developed product. Uh, since then, the network has grown from uh, facilitating kind of round the year sharing of updates and learnings to supporting a pan sector community of organisations and individuals delivering and supporting justice. And we now work with over 900 individuals who represent 600 organisations in seven sectors, uh, but who are all sharing these common goals around supporting vulnerable people. Uh, to access and utilise their legal rights. Um, I'm just going to use this opportunity, if I may, to talk through a couple of kind of technology based developments from the network's point of view. Um, one of the papers that we made available in the, the handout for this uh, conference uh, was an update on the justice and innovation group that we helped facilitate. Um, and obviously, members of that group have joined the CJC here today. So, as a group, we kind of represent and we're open to join um, individuals, organisations and initiatives who are interested in supporting or undertaking work using innovative methods in the access to justice space. And the purpose of doing that is really twofold. Firstly, as we're doing here today, to share updates on work in this area with the rest of our community and to ensure work is coordinated. And secondly, to use the community to crowdsource guidance, intelligence and insight to support projects and identify individuals and initiatives with collaboration potential. Um, and that collaboration potential that Sir Jeffrey highlighted as so important to future success. Um, we wanted to share this update with the CJC to showcase that on a practical level, as well as on a strategic one, we're collectively progressing coordination and collaboration across the sector in this area. Also just wanted to mention that the uh, LIP network itself has launched its new online platform. And this platform acts as an online knowledge and resource hub, which collects curated information, resources and services on identified areas of importance. Um, our new platform, we're really pleased to announce, allows um, members to find and connect with colleagues, access resources, at, ask for help and support from the community, and most importantly, keep up to date with what's going on. So um, for anyone who's interested in keeping up to date with developments in between the CJC forum, please do consider joining. Um, I will stop speaking now, thankfully, uh, and move on to letting the sector speak for themselves on what they've been doing to progress our ambitions around providing justice services online. These updates all showcase some of the qualities that Sir Geoffrey highlighted on the importance of service design and involving users in developments as well. So we're really pleased to have them here with us today. Um, just a brief note, we don't have time to do an update on everything that we wanted to. Um, there's been so much progress and development in this area. So part of the papers we distributed also contain a link to an additional document which highlights some other initiatives that we won't get to. Um, but without further ado, um, I would like to introduce uh, Mary Marvel, who is the Deputy CEO and Head of Communications at Law for Life. They run the Advice Now website, and Mary will talk about their affordable advice pathway and online tools. Hello, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I wanted to talk to you about some of the resources we have on Advice Now. Uh, if you don't know Advice Now, it has a, a heck of a lot of resources for uh, litigants in person, as well as those uh, trying to deal with, with family issues, housing issues, benefit issues, uh, and other legal issues outside of court. Um, the first thing I wanted to tell you about today is our affordable advice pathway. Um, 
The pathway enables users of our step-by-step -step guides to divide money and property when you divorce uh, and dealing with child arrangements, again, both uh, before court and, and using the court process, with access to low-cost fixed-fee help from one of a panel of resolution family solicitors. Uh, we know that many of our users, many litigants in person, don't access the legal advice they need, even those with a little bit of money, because of, because of high prices, uh, a lack of clarity about how much it will cost, and uncertainty about uh, quality and, and usefulness. Um, how the pathway works is that the reader uses our guides as they always did. Uh, they are easy to use, they're broken down into manageable sections, they help with the, the uh, skills and confidence as well as, as the knowledge needed. But when they arrive at a point when it is particularly critical, uh, particularly important for them to get advice if they can afford it, uh, to decide, for example, what they should do with the family home or if they should take the issue to court, they arrive uh, at, a, at a point like this that I, I think you can see on the, on the screen. Um, uh, if they select that they, they would like to, to um, find out more, they come to a page like this, which again uh, explains what is covered in the appointment, um, and, and the price, the £120, including VAT, uh, no extra costs. And from there, you can choose a solicitor as you scroll down, thank you. And you can see um, how and where uh, appointments are available, in this case, uh, day or evening, phone, FaceTime or WhatsApp. Um, and then they can go through and they send their details to the solicitor. At the same time as that, they themselves get a questionnaire that they have to complete and send back to the solicitor two days before the appointment. This questionnaire contains all the details that the solicitor needs to be able to provide the advice quickly and efficiently uh, on the day, which obviously is key to keeping the price as low as possible. Um, we launched in late February, which wasn't great timing, uh, but so far feedback from clients and solicitors is very positive. And interestingly, 80% of the survey respondents who use this service have said that they either definitely wouldn't have got advice without this service or they didn't know if they would have. Um, thank you. The, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about was our our mandatory reconsideration request tools. Uh, we have these for uh, personal independent payment and disability living allowance, and we have one in development uh, for universal credit and ESA. Uh, they are available on our, on our help to deal with pro uh, benefits problems page. These tools aren't in any way complicated. We developed them on a ridiculously small budget uh, in response to the reduction of availability of help with benefit appeals and the, and the huge number of claimants uh, not receiving a, a correct decision. We had three aims in mind to go some way towards mitigating the loss of the advisor in providing the user with the reassurance that they had a case that they shouldn't just give up and go home. And so the tool helps people uh, work, work that out and tells them what they think they should have got um, to encourage action and to help people not to put it off because they weren't confident about what to do or, or what the letter should say. And thirdly, to help claimants make their case as best they can. These tools uh, have been very, very popular. They produce more than a thousand personalized letters each month uh, and actually, according to our survey respondents, which are a self-selecting group and not necessarily repetitive, uh, representative rather, uh, of our users, they do, it does suggest that users of this tool are substantially more likely to get their decision changed at reconsideration stage uh, than, than the national average. Uh, we've just released new versions of these tools. Uh, and one of the changes is that you now need to log in to use the tool. The reason for this is that then users are able to stop at any time, save their progress and come back to it later 
as I'm sure you can imagine, the tool is used by many disabled people and, and their families, uh, and some of whom will struggle to do it all in one go. So this seemed a, a really important improvement to make. But I think that's the end of my allotted time, uh, but I'm, I'm really grateful for the chance to, to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. That was fantastic. And I hope um, I did OK in keeping up to speed with you with the presentation. Um, next of all, I'm going to bring in Lizzie Allen, who is Head of Services at Support Through Court. And she's going to give an overview and update of the Safe Spaces project they're working on in partnership with RCJ Advice. Good afternoon, everybody. So the Safe Spaces project arose from as everybody else, uh, having to adapt very quickly to remote support for litigants in person where everything we did before was face to face. One of the issues we faced was the fact that many of our volunteers are in the at risk groups, um, many of them being older and retired. And so a lot of them wanted to carry on helping clients, um, but they had to be able to do it from home. And again, like everybody else, we made great use of Zoom. And one of the ways that we can do this is to have Zoom in the office or one of our offices connected to the volunteer on their own Zoom at home. And this led us to the Safe Spaces project, which is aimed at digitally competent clients who may not have a quiet space at home. And that's been referenced earlier today. So it may just be the household dynamic or it might be domestic abuse. There'll be all sorts of reasons for it. But if the litigant in person can get themselves into a court site with a support through court service, they can sit with a tablet in a sound muffling pod. So they're in their own private space and they would connect with a volunteer at home working on their own Zoom access. So our volunteers would be on hand to get the system started. And then once the client is happy, we would leave them to carry on and we'd have volunteers and staff members on hand for troubleshooting uh, if they found hiccups as they were going through the process. But essentially they're in uh, a, a sound muffling pod, a private space, just talking to our volunteer at the other end. The extra dimension to this, which is where RCG advice comes in, is that the funding also covers dedicated access to a family solicitor. As most of you know, support through court doesn't provide legal advice. And one of our most useful factors is to be able to signpost people to that advice, particularly if we see them early in their case, and actually they can get guidance at the beginning. So with this family work through the Safe Spaces project, we have access to Georgina Kirby, um, RCJ Advice Family Solicitor, and we're able to refer clients straight through to her. It's in the early stages. We don't have huge numbers yet, but we know that the people who have used it have really benefited from it. And at the moment, it's located at the Central Family Court and at our service in Nottingham and we will hopefully be rolling it out to other locations in due course. And as soon as we have more reliable data on it, we will make sure that we're sharing that within the network. Thank Absolutely. you. Mom. Thank you so much, Lizzie. That was fantastic. Um, one of the benefits of having the cross sector community that we have is that it provides a space for external developers uh, from private legal or tech sectors to engage with access to justice issues when they're commissioned to design for the vulnerable communities that we serve. Um, which is why we're especially pleased to welcome initiatives like uh, that of Alex Monaco and Monaco Solicitors who we're welcoming next. Um, Alex is a senior partner at Monaco Solicitors and is here to give us a demonstration of virtual lawyer and an update on their partnerships with University House Legal Advice Center and working families. Thank you very much, Martha. And thank you very much to Sir Jeffrey Boss, Sir Robin Knowles, and all of you ladies and gentlemen who have um, 
dedicated your time today to a, a very noble cause, access to justice. It's a cause very close to my heart, something I'm very passionate about. Um, throughout my legal career, I was uh, she started off in legal aid doing criminal defence and asylum and immigration law. Uh, I actually read one of Professor Suskin's books on um, the end of lawyers in 2008, which kind of got me thinking about using technology to promote law. So I started blogging on Google and it, it made my own law firm in the end. I now get a, a couple of thousand visitors a day on, on the, my website, Monaco Solicitors, and ended up writing, writing my own book as well about employment law, which uh, just helps people to navigate the way through uh, not only an employment tribunal, but also uh, a negotiation um, if they've been treated badly at work, perhaps it's discrimination or unfair dismissal, something like that. Now, only 16% of our cases actually get a lawyer in the end. And I was sort of obsessing over the 84%. Uh, unfortunately for my lawyers who kind of wanted me to focus on the 16 and eventually came up with this product called Virtual Lawyer, which is... Uh, a free letter writing tool that helps people who may be not very legally literate, which is frankly most people, or even people who might not be too literate in general to write their own letter. And the way where we're going with that is enabling people to write their grounds of claim as well, the particulars of claim, and to take people all the way through not only an employment law um, process and a tribunal, but also other types of law too. So I'd like to uh, share my screen if I may, and just to demonstrate this, it is actually live uh, now on our um, on our on our website, so it is something that I'm not sort of having to dig into a video or something like that. This is the website. I think is that possible for people to see? I think that hopefully is possible. Yeah. So, oh, you, you you have to click share screen. Okay, is that sharing now? Okay. Well, let me know when it's sharing and I can uh, I'll carry on. All right, we'll try, try again. I've just pressed stop share. Maybe it was because I was, I was trying to share at the same time. How about now? No problem. Um, not to worry, listen, luckily, um, here's what I made earlier. So on, on my phone here, it's live and direct. I'm just going to have to take you through it. So it's asking you, are you still in your job? So you're going to press, I'm still working or not. It's a nice interface. It's quite colorful. It's got, um, you know, big writing and people can choose. It's quite easy to use. And we found this is a real big design problem, condensing law into something understandable. So I think of law as, as too much information. So LAW equals TMI. Now how do you get too much information into a, a mobile device? As Sir Jeffrey mentioned earlier, most people do have access to smartphones now, right? So once you get through to that, you then selecting your paragraphs, um, it gets a bit more detailed. And then here you are, you have a legal letter, which is basically fully bespoke and customized to your case. Now that sounds great, but of course, the question I'm hearing is what about the free text, right? What about the bit that makes it your case? So you can get a good bespoke template, which is what we've built. But to do the free text, we need to use artificial intelligence for that. And I just want to introduce um, just a word from my lead data scientist, Harpal King, who really is a future leader of research in this field and um, come in um, as you did graduate from Imperial College London and then through industry, through Samsung Electronics, very fortunately to us. Harpal, uh, take it away, please. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Harpal King and I aim to address the problems with free text using two algorithms initially. Firstly is style transfer. Style transfer is the method by which we can infuse the writing style of one user into the text of another. That way we'll be able to use the user's free text in lay speech and convert that into something that can sounds like it was written by a lawyer. Secondly, I'd like to utilize the advances in argumentation mining. 
What that basically lets us do is detect automatically and analyze pieces of reasoning and argumentation within text. By leveraging that, we aim to help provide the user with the best points to help suit their argument. Now, in collaboration with my alma mater at Imperial College London, we're currently working on this together. And with the data here at Monaco Solicitors, we believe that puts us in the best position to help accelerate access to justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harpal. I'm just conscious of the time, so I'll wrap it up. And Martha has put in her handout details of how you can learn more about this product. We are reaching out, we're trying to partner up um, with, with more people in the legal profession. We've already partnered up with University House um, Legal Advice Centre and working family to create a platform for legal advisors to collaborate and to also input their data and to share that. And the details of that um, are on my website. So on Monaco Solicitors, just underneath the logo, you can find the PDF there too. And we really would like to hear from you guys out there just with any support you have, moral support, you know, whether you have suggestions of, of partnerships, it is quite tough out there. And it, it, you know, even my own lawyers don't really want me to do this um, because we are, we are literally sort of cannibalizing ourselves. But, um, but do, do get in touch. And if you, if you need to get me directly, my email address is alex.monaco at monacosolicitors.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, we will be sharing information around uh, the virtual lawyer tool and its development as part of the Justice and Innovation Group. So please do feel free to use that collective as a way to engage with these products and um, projects as well. Um, I'm delighted now to uh, introduce Emily McLeod, who is the Digital Development Lead at the Law Centers Network, and she'll be giving an overview and update on the law on LCN's uh, inquiry management tool. Thanks so much, Martha. Um, so at Law Centers Network, um, when we started our digital journey, um, we learned very quickly uh, that managing client demand um, was one of the biggest problems facing law centers. And across this year and certainly into next, this is going to continue to remain a priority for a number of law centers. It's an area we've been unpicking and we started with a small SMS tool that supported appointment reminders. And after speaking with clients um, halfway through this year, um, we've been led to focus in on inquiry management and specifically focusing in on that point of, of first contact with the, with the law center. So um, we involved a couple of ex-law um, centre receptionists in our uh, mini design team and um, the solution that we've developed that we're going to demo today um, hopes to help staff to ensure that no client is, is lost between various systems um, and will hopefully allow staff to accurately and, and passively report on, on client demand. So I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and hopefully this video will work. Okay, great. I can I can speak speak at that. Sorry, I've just heard that the um, the audio is not working. So um, just to highlight here, um, what you're seeing in front of you is um, the inquiry management suite, um, and effectively what it is is a is a platform, um, and it's built um, using Twilio components. So we haven't we haven't um, sort of developed anything from, from scratch. We've tried to reuse things where possible. Um, and once it's configured, um, what it allows the Law Centre staff to do um, is to capture all of the emails and all of the telephone calls in one place. Um, so I'm just gonna continue to play and I'll speak over it as we go through. So it is also web-based, so you don't need to download anything at the Law Centre. And so um, what's being demoed now is um, a help seeker calling the Law Centre, and that's being picked up um, online. 
And so what you're able to do at this stage is to just go ahead and, and add a, a summary of, of the inquiry. And at, at this stage, those fields are, um, uh, are fields that we've been testing out with a, a couple of law centre staff. And then um, importantly, what this allows you to do is to action each inquiry that comes through. So you can either signpost it um, and add where you've signposted it to, um, or you can, um, uh, or you can um, uh, sort of uh, process it um, else uh, in using some other form. And so here, what we're trying to show is that um, with, with inquiries, um, the aim of the game is to really move all open inquiries to the closed bucket. And oftentimes there's a bit of back and forth between um, the, the front desk and the caseworker in determining whether or not um, the, the legal case can get picked up. And so the pending bucket allows you to um, pick up those inquiries. So here's a, here's a case that's happened before. Um, and you can see all of the, the conversations that's that's being um, that's that the um, help seeker has has made previously. So I'm going to pause there and just and just exit my screen. Apologies about that, guys. That uh, we weren't able to to play that video, but I can I can play it with Martha. I can share it with Martha after this. Um, and it's something that we didn't show there, but which is which is quite cool is um, uh, the ability to collect all of those statistics. Um, so in terms of um, next steps, what we're hoping to do is, is pilot with a couple of law centres. Um, we've already started a few pilots uh, with law centres um, at the back end of, of this year. Um, and uh, at the end of sort of 2021, we're exploring sort of the use beyond law centres. So um, uh, over back to you, Martha, um, and thank you so much. And apologies about the, uh, the technical hiccup. No worries. Thanks so much, Emily. I think we're doing pretty well on tech hiccups for a, a tech conference as well. So um, it's all good. All part of the process, they say. Um, yeah, as Emily says, we'll be able to share the links to those videos as well later. So that'll be available for you. Um, I'd like now to introduce uh, Jennifer Swire, who is the director at Law Tech UK. And she'll just be giving us an overview and an update on the uh, Law Tech project that she's working on. Thank you, Martha. And hello, everyone. Yes, just to share an overview of LawTech UK so you have it um, on your radar. So LawTech UK is a collaboration and an initiative between the Ministry of Justice that funds it, our fantastic panel and advisory board, um, the LawTech UK panel, which includes Richard Suskind, um, Sir Geoffrey Voss, Christina Blacklaws, um, members of, of academia and the tech community cross-sector uh, leadership and Tech Nation, uh, which is an organisation that is on the growth of um, the tech community uh, across the UK. And the purpose of, of Law Tech UK, the reason it was established, it started out as, um, as the panel, the, the, then the, uh, the Law Tech Delivery Panel. And its purpose is to support the digital transformation of the legal sector overall. So in light of, of what society and the economy need um, and to ensure the UK continues its leadership in law um, on the global stage and, and keeps pace with uh, technological advancement. Now, the focus of Law Tech UK is commercial uh, for now. There are other government initiatives focusing on citizen access to justice, but we are very focused at Law Tech UK on the shared challenges um, and what we can address and the infrastructure that we can uh, build um, and how that can support um, as a platform for the wider sector uh, that, that can be scaled over time. And the focus of Law Tech UK is, as I say, on the transformative um, aspect. So as, as Sir Geoffrey mentioned earlier, not the, the aspects around automation and efficiency, although they're very important, 
but more looking at the more transformative end of innovation. What is it that could reinvent, reimagine um, the sector and service and systems in a way that serves the needs, uh, the changing needs of, of society and, and business? And also the cross sector working that there is the potential for and we're particularly interested in the public and private sector intersection and what can be done if we come together around shared challenges and opportunities which you're, you're doing on this session today and in terms of the practical work programs so some of you may have seen sir jeffrey's work um, on the legal statement on smart contracts and crypto assets that landed last year and there's further work happening on the practical implementation and aspects of that um, there is Remote Courts Worldwide, which you may have seen, which is an initiative um, led by Richard Suskind, which is all about the um, global justice community coming together to figure out how we do remote uh, justice. Um, and an initiative called the Law Tech Sandbox, which is all about accelerating um, the transformative innovation ideas, products and services that are out there in the market to see if we can support them to get to proof of value and, and implementation and, and growth faster. Um, there are some interesting things to keep an eye on in relation to that. So we have just opened the sandbox in pilot. It will run for three months um, and we will test all our hypotheses around what is possible and what we've heard that the sector needs, particularly in respect of access to data, cross-sector regulator engagement and access to decision makers at the right time. So we will see, and there are a couple of projects that are of great interest and may be transferable to this sector. One is an organization called Legal Utopia that is looking at um, delivering diagnostics and free tooling to support people um, to access, their, um, access the support that they need and, and, and actually to take some matters into their own hands. And there, there is also a project around um, digitizing and, and making smart laws and documentation in order that uh, society can can uh, engage uh, more simply with those laws um, and and uh, also a sort of translation layer to legalese which i think we all need um, there is also a piece of work that we're doing uh, focused around the 50 billion in late payments 50 50 billion pounds of late payments that sits in the system every year for individuals and small businesses uh, and the 11.6 billion in litigation fees that they carry with all the mental health and other issues uh, related to that. So we're, we're looking at a proof of concept and a feasibility study working with a consortium including uh, some at Oxford University and, and, and uh, uh, two tech companies and looking at what a relationship first model would look like in respect of dispute resolution and how that could plug in to the existing court system uh, and provide um, a mechanism to support with the volume that we are seeing that is, is obviously increasing in dispute resolution and addressing that culture piece that Sir Geoffrey was talking about earlier. So you will hear more on, on this if, if this is of interest in the first quarter of next year as we crystallise uh, and continue to develop on some of um, these projects. So we wanted to share those things with you and we look forward to being in touch if relevant in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So we really look forward to working with you um, when appropriate in the future. And it's great to be able to link in with these other initiatives to see what learning we can share across our, our different interest areas. Um, that's all from the updates uh, side of things. So thank you very much for, to everyone for your interest and your presentations. Um, and I'll hand over to Nick Hanning uh, to support the panel. Contributed to those updates um, with a special shout, I think, to Alex, because I think I mean, he may not have intended it, but seeing that on the phone was actually really important because it uh, highlighted the accessibility. Um, right now, we can turn our attention to the key focus for our discussion, which is identifying the challenges we need to overcome to allow us to make better use of technology. Um, and I'm really pleased to be joined um, as part of an overall panel um, by uh, three people with considerable experience in this area. Um, first, um, we're expecting uh, Alison Lamb, the Chief Executive at RCJ Advice to be joining us. Um, she's um, on her way virtually, um, so I'm sure she'll be here in a second. Um, but I'm also joined 
um, by Roger Smith OBE, um, who has a huge, very long-standing uh, history and unparalleled experience, both of the advice sector and technology. Um, but I hope you'll forgive me if I just for now call him the editor of the Law, Technology and Access to Justice blog. Um, and I'm also joined by Richard Susskind OBE, who again has very many hats, um, but I hope uh, will allow me to introduce him simply as the IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice for now. Uh, during these sessions, if you have any questions, do please put them using the Q&A function um, and um, we will then put those through to the panel um, as we can. But first and foremost, um, uh, let me reintroduce Roger and ask him um, to give us an overview on the use of technology internationally. Yeah, uh, as other speakers have said, COVID-19 has really turbo boost boosted, or our reaction to COVID-19, turbo boosted uh, the advance of technology. And as I think Chili Reid said, in nine years of the conference, people's attitude to technology has really moved. We've, we've moved from a, a sort of, uh, is it whether, uh, why, to how. Uh, and we've also uh, encountered issues internationally. The, the issue of COVID-19 is international. The issue of technology is international. The issue of financial stringency, both now and in the future, is international. So we can look around and we can see other jurisdictions grappling with the same issues as ours. And for example, uh, last week, an organization in Australia, Justice Connect, produced a booklet which is on the net uh, and which is, I think, the last word uh, that you have to read if you're going to devise anything uh, informational online. Uh, and it's the market leader. It's where you have to go and you have to show you've read it and you have to absorb what it said. And this kind of international influence is uh, increasing and will increase. And there are four streams that I think we can identify in terms of moving technology on. The first is, and people have talked about this in various ways, a whole bundle of things which been about how um, we had to improve our management to deal with remote working. Uh, that was the source of what Lizzie was talking about uh, earlier on. Every organisation has had to suddenly, somewhere around March and April, uh, develop systems, expand on systems to work internationally. And that's required a number of things. From the very basic of it's extremely hard to do if you haven't got the standard Microsoft Office suite of applications. Very hard to do if you're doing serious work without a cloud-based case management system. You've got to be able to manage your data. You've got to be able to support your staff. Um, these are general issues for the legal profession, legal services as a whole. And we can probably learn, we undoubtedly can learn uh, from others how we've done that by video and so on. There's a lot of experience about that. It's not contained within our sector. Uh, we need to grab it. We need to use it. We need to come up to what are the sort of commercial standards in that field. The second stream uh, is what Richard's going to talk about, which is the digitalization of the courts. Um, you cannot be a benefit advisor in the future without also being totally competent uh, in terms of handling uh, online processes and procedures. Being advised in a little advice uh, centre in the middle of a town um, are going to have to be really digitally competent, have, going to have to master the, the management tools, going to need the management tools that I talked about in the first stream. Uh, and there are interesting issues there in relation to um, courts and tribunals. Uh, one of which I just want to log is, uh, isn't it right that self-represented litigants should really choose themselves uh, whether they have a right to a hearing, where they have one now, uh, rather than being bundled into a digital procedure if they don't like it? I think that's something which is a sector we have to look at. The third and the really interesting area is where technology will affect the way in which or the services we actually deliver. Uh, and there are a number of trends there which again are international. There is the whole trend of legal design and uh, user empowerment. A great guru of legal design was Margaret Hagan in the States. Um, that's uh, again the thread in the Justice Connect document. Um, it's a very interesting and exciting way of looking at how you devise materials 
Uh, no time to go into the detail of it now, but it has massive potential for actually reworking uh, uh, procedures we use at the now and not just automating what there is. Uh, and there are a lot of strands to what we might want to do, tools we might want to use. People have talked about um, self-assembly documentation, and it's really noticeable that if you want to come to the home of self-assembly documentation, you don't go to the United Kingdom, you go to the United States. They have been producing self-assembled documents of self-represented litigants, um, surrounding them with the backup that's required uh, quite consistently for five or six years. They've produced many millions of them. Uh, and it's clear, much legal, if many legal issues end up with a document um, and the sort of thing which one of those solicitors was showing or that uh, advice now, now working on, that's the kind of thing we need to develop and expand and people can do for themselves. We need, and this is something which nobody's raised yet, we need, I think, to move beyond the static website to a more interactive website. Um, those with long memories will remember the Dutch rec visor, but you go to My Law BC, and what you get if you consult it is tailored information to you, not just a list of the five, uh, five issues that mean you're a tenant and not a licensee, but guiding you individually and bridging that general advice to specific, the general information to specific advice. That's a whole frontier where there are some really good examples around the world. There's the whole issue of outreach. I was fascinated to see the South West London Law Centres and uh, People's Law School in British Columbia have both got on to having open Zoom uh, trainings on debt uh, uh, and other issues as a way of replicating the kind of outreach of town hall meetings that you might have had in the past, but doing it digitally. Now, they won't meet everybody. They won't work in, to get to the same people who might come physically, but they are a way of replicate, of expanding, of adapting uh, the use of outreach to the digital uh, age. And one of the lessons which is coming out internationally, and which I think is really, really important that we need to look at is the best answer for making the most use of what we've got is what's becoming known as blended services. The combination of automated assistance with individual assistance. Uh, which you can get to, you don't have to be physically present, if you have a video connection or telephone connection, it's that chat function effectively. Uh, Thank you so much, Roger. Really need. And digital will not be... I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting a little, I'm sorry, we're very, sorry. very short on time, um, so I hope you don't mind my mind interrupting. Um, that was really, really fascinating and it's going to be very important uh, as, we, as we look ahead. Um, coming back a little closer to home, or much closer to home, um, I'm thrilled that Alison has joined us. Uh, Alison, in your capacity as CEO of, uh, re of um, RCJ Advice, uh, you've overseen the implementation of uh, both CourtNav and Flows. And I wonder if you could just share very briefly what they are, but more importantly, um, how user intervention ha has, has been in integral to that. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. Yeah, of course. Um, and I'd like to touch on, on Roger's point as well of, of blended delivery, because I think CourtNav is a real, really good example of that. Um, Flows is finding legal option for women survivors, and it's, in, it's designed to inject and embed legal advice into frontline organisations. So they're aware of legal remedies that women can access and also that women themselves can access. As part of this, we devised CourtNav, a tool that would support people through completing an FL401 form, which is the non-molestation order and the occupation order. Um, CourtNav went through a really um, detailed development process, which we tried to uh, embed user involvement in that. And that's what I'm going to touch on. But the first thing I'd say is, is we were very carefully um, devising CourtNav and then COVID hit. So we got, COVID, we got CourtNav out there quite quickly on April the 17th. So we've got, we've got um, experience of, of usage. And also I should say, although I'm saying flows is finding legal option for women survivors, CourtNav is a publicly available tool. So it's available to everybody, including men and transgender, um, as well as, as women. So CourtNav FL 401, it's a process where a user sets up an account 
and then they answer a number of questions and as Roger says they can then access and see information which is tailored to their circumstances. They can also um, get further information, it's also peppered with uh, legal advice and they can also ask a question of a solicitor and that will be responded to in time. So that, that's it's a really interactive process for them. At the end of that process, they should have the completed FL401 form, but importantly, they should also have the witness statement which goes along with that form. And also, if they need any additional uh, court forms, such as the C8, to hide their address, that is also dealt with by CourtNav. But as I say, CourtNav went through um, endless iterations of discussion um, and it was refined and added to and continues to be added to. And at the core, we want it to be user friendly for survivors. Um, I think to engage women right from the start, we were really, really um, dependent on frontline organisations such as Women's Aid and Refuges. They enabled us to talk to the women that they worked with. They consulted the women. The women had the trust with those, those workers. And I think in the first engagement, that confirmed for us the safety elements that we should have in court now. So we've got quick close, we've got removing browse history, um, we've got access to language line if, if, if somebody um, with English as a second language wants support in going through court now. And that all arose from women thinking about how they would best access, access court now. We also did a test of CourtNav with 50 survivors in, a, in, a, in, in a, an artificial setting um, and saw how they used the tool and listened to how they found the tool. Um, women filling out the CourtNav tool surprised us by saying that um, answering questions about their experience, um, we asked them about the, the most recent, the worst um, incident of, of, of abuse. They actually described that as empowering and said one of the key things that contributed to that was they were able to do that in their own time with the support of um, a, a, a refuge worker who they trusted, who knew them over a series of, of time. Um, and they, they contrasted that to talking to a lawyer who they, they wouldn't know. Um, I think it's it's also been a challenge to, to think how we get to users in real time. And we've built in um, three simple questions during CourtNav, which ascertain their user, um, how they use the system and their understanding of the process. So we've had um, 544 total respondents on um, a Likert scale of one being low up to seven. 96% of, of, of the users find that questions are easy to understand on CourtNav. 96% also find that CourtNav is easy to, to use. 74% understand what happens next once they've completed CourtNav because their application goes to a legal aid provider. There is 85 domestic abuse legal aid providers around the country providing a 24 hour coverage. We realised that part of the process wasn't that clear to survivors. So we've added additional um, details and we've now generated a client notification email that explains where their, their, their service has gone. So throughout the process, I feel it's a really blended process. We know it works. Um, uh, over a thousand applications are going through each month now through CourtNav um, and we're adding, we're learning all the time and we're adding different features in response to, to customer feedback. So um, what we've heard a, a good deal about then is, is what's happening in the here and now, both nationally and internationally. Um, I'd like, if I may, then to turn to uh, Richard Suskin to, uh, you're so good at predicting the future. What does the future look like? And in particular, what then should we be focusing on to make sure that we keep step with that? Thank you very much, Nick. And thank you, Sir Robin, as ever, for bringing this community together for our what is an annual and vital discussion. I want to reflect just very quickly on the problem we face and the mindset we should have in tackling this problem. 
reflect also a little on what COVID has done to our thinking about technology in the courts, and then take a quick glance into the future. The problem, of course, has been exacerbated by COVID. Hearing rooms have closed and large backlogs are building up. But the problem we face, and that's ju just in our jurisdictions, is the reality is that most civil disputes cost too much, they take too long, the process is excessively combative. It's also unintelligible unless you're a lawyer and surely is out of step in a digital society. Other jurisdictions have more staggering backlogs, just to put us in context, 80 million in Brazil, 30 million in India. But the stat that disturbs me the most is that of OECD, which says that only 46% of human beings in our world live under the protection of the law, which I think should bring collective shame to the legal world. We have to do a better job. Isn't it weird that now more people have access to the internet, 59%, than access to justice, 46%. So what mindset should we have in thinking about the future? I think we ask the question, is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to assemble together on all occasions to resolve our legal differences? Or in a digital society, might we have different ways, technology-based ways of resolving our disputes? And in thinking about technology, we've got to get beyond the first 60 years of legal and court technology, which has hinted at by Sir Jeffrey and Jennifer has been about automation, grafting technologies onto our old ways of working, enhancing and supporting our traditional ways of working. We need to move to transformation. The use of technology, not simply to support our old ways of working, but of allowing us to work in entirely different ways. That's the challenge of technology that frankly, most other sectors are facing. So COVID-19, what happened and what's its impact on the court system. Have a look at remote courts worldwide. This is a, a LawTech UK Society of Computers and Law uh, HMCTS initiative. We've gathered together, as Jennifer mentioned, news and views from over 50 jurisdictions. And essentially, as physical courtrooms shut, remote courts open, audio hearings, video hearings, and hearings on the paper alone. But the dominant technology has been video hearings. And I think we can make six observations about video hearings. First of all, actually, they work in some cases rather well and much better than most lawyers and judges would have anticipated in January or February. There's a lesson here about technology. Secondly, contrary to the common belief that lawyers can't change, in fact, when the pressure was on, judges and lawyers adapted very quickly to working in new ways. So during this period, I think it's important to say that some minds have been opened and some minds have even been changed. In a way, COVID provides a wonderful springboard for us to use more ambitious uses of technology that can reach far wider into the community. I think it is worth saying also, fourthly, that lawyers are still of an automation mindset. That's to say, they're still grafting technology uh, onto our old ways of working, dropping hearings into Zoom. So there's a bit, fifthly, a polarizing effect here. Post COVID, some people want to go back to the way we always used to work. Others say, actually, we should never return. I think it's true also that COVID's both accelerated and decelerated technological change. A lot of the more uh, exotic uses of technology have been put on back burner while we've dropped hearings into Zoom. The future has not arrived. We're at the foothills still, folks. Working from the kitchen table is not a full transformation of a court system. Dropping hearings into Zoom is not a shift in paradigm. The people, the rules, the process, the cost, the complexity, the unintelligibility is still with us, whether or not you're in Zoom or physical courtroom. Covered's like an experiment in virtual vis uh, video hearings. We've got to gather data about what's worked well so we can industrialize it, but we should use this as a springboard to the future. And the future for me has five elements. Firstly, asynchronous online judging. This is the idea where there isn't a physical hearing or overall evidence. The evidence and arguments are submitted electronically, almost like an exchange of emails amongst parties within the judge and the judge responds in kind. The asynchronous bit is you don't all need to be together or available at the same time to communicate. No days off work, convenience of working indeed from the kitchen table. Secondly, extended court service. I believe it's not enough in the digital age for the state simply to provide the primary function of authoritative dispute resolution by judges. We need to go further. We need systems online of the sort that have been discussed in this session 
that help users understand their rights and obligations, that help them understand the options available to them, that can help them organize their evidence, that can help them marshal their evidence, that offers online tools to help them negotiate or perhaps mediate their problems, not as an alternative private sector necessarily, but actually baked into the court system. That's what I call the extended court system. It's controversial, but I believe if we're delivering justice, that's what we should build. In the meantime, or though perhaps as well, we can have some of these services, thirdly, as front ends, new substitutes to where we can have these services linked into the court system, but as a private sector or perhaps charitable uh, provision rather than part of the court system. Fourthly, artificial intelligence to help people understand their rights, to help them predict the likelihood of success, even predictions as a form of determinations, very controversial stuff, but we'll see that coming through uh, too. But above all else, perhaps, the fifth thing to watch for is dispute avoidance. Most people prefer a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. And we need to think how we put in place systems and processes to help people avoid disputes, to help people contain disputes as well as to resolve them. Finally then, folks, I know the skepticism about online courts, but the key issue here, if your concern really is access to justice, it's not whether or not online courts will replace traditional courts or which of the two are superior. For me, it's whether online courts can take on at least some of the work that traditional courts do not or cannot. That's about widening access to justice. And I feel more confident than ever that the judicious use of technology, taking account of vulnerable people, taking account of those who don't have access, but the judicious use of technology is the key way for us to help people understand and enforce their entitlements. Thank you. Back to you, Nick. Thank you so much, Richard. And I'm, I'm grateful to all three of you for being so generous and cutting short your time. I'm sorry we've had to limit you um, in that way. Um, what I, I'm going to sum up what I think the, the, the overarching message is, um, possibly doing a disservice, but it seems to me that very much that the message is that technology is there and is a but is a tool. It is innovation um, that is really going to be key in, and using technology in the right way um, to to bring in those innovations to make us think think differently. I think a, a second message I would like to send out is that to keep on top of all of this, it's a very fast moving um, environment. Um, it really should be part of the lit network and the justice and innovation group um, to be able to share more information um, and to keep up to date with developments and discussions throughout the year, not just at these forums, but, but, but throughout. Their next session, in fact, in March will be themed around a year of the pandemic. Um, and that's going to focus specifically on the different ways of working that have been implemented, what innovations have been incorporated on a longer term basis and what um, has and hasn't changed it's exactly the themes we've been exploring. So please do um, join and, and, and participate in that for more information. I fear um, we don't have enough time to take any major questions. Um, so unless Robin gives me the thumbs up to um, take one of the questions, I think we may have to end here because we're already running over a, li a little over. No, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to take take any questions after all. Um, so I will hand back to Robin, thanking everybody who's contributed to this session. Uh, Nick, can we say thank you to Nick? Can we say thank you to you and to Martha for a remarkable session, e even without the Can we say th can we say thank you to to you, Nick, and to Martha, uh, even without the questions, which are going to be part of the part of the future? Um, can I also uh, uh, join in your thanks to the panel? Um, and may I just single out the professors Suskind and Smith? They've been alongside these issues their whole career, and they're going to stay right alongside us and that is so valuable i'm hoping we have the opportunity to bring in briefly the contribution from scotland that we were not able to bring in this morning um if if we um my fingers are crossed i hope yours are yeah. um if uh laura is here laura is here off you mm -hmm. go can you hear me now? Yes. 
Oh, Good. fantastic. Thank God. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much, Robin, for having me today. I am representing uh, the advice sector uh, in Scotland. Uh, we were meant to be joined by Rebe Rebecca Samaras from uh, the University of Edinburgh, who's the pro bono um, clinic director, um, but sadly she can't be with us today, so she's made me a honorary Scot. It's just to give you a bit of an update of what's been happening in Scotland. Um, and I've been asked to comment on some of the challenges and the successes um, Scotland have had. So as a, to start with the difficulties, so the, as a result of the pandemic, um, it, it has made a real impact, impact on access to justice. So especially with the courts, um, um, with them all closing and going uh, online, there has been a little bit of a backlog of um, cases in both in the civil and criminal courts. Um, with uh, cuts uh, to legal aid, and not only just that, with um, staff redundancies and staff being on furlough, this has um, really slowed down the system. Um, and proposed cuts um, to the across the advice sector in Scotland. Uh, so, for example, in Glasgow, there's been threats of cuts to um, to eight uh, organisations which are a mix of uh, advice and law centres. Um, there's been lots of campaigning around this um, to, to try and stop it, and Glasgow City Council have backed off, um, but it's still uh, an unresolved issue. Um, so that this has put a bit of a strain on the on the advice sector. But going on to a bit of uh, positivity and to explain what has worked. So um, as we saw the pandemic, there's been better uh, partnerships and collaboration between the charities, um, the, the main advice charities in Scotland uh, and the law centres and the university, university law clinics. And um, as a result of the Access to Justice Foundation initiating the Community Justice Fund, um, and with huge thanks to our uh, funding partners of that, so for example, Theory and um, uh, the Paul Hamlin, Paul Hamlin Foundation, so on and so forth, um, we have um, distributed just over £450,000 um, to uh, advice charities in Scotland, and it's just it's helped to make all the charities collaborate and work together to deliver the unmet need. And finally, um, we just really like to champion, um, although minus a day with the technology technology difficulties I've had, um, that um, technology has really been. Um, embraced and the advice sector is adapted well to it. It's, um, it means that the um, charities have really reached out to those who need advice um, uh, most um, and deliver advice effectively online. Although uh, the next challenge we have is, is, to, is to try and deliver advice to the most vulnerable people in society, um, meaning our, the homelessness mm -hmm. and also those with um, very uh, those who have very complex needs um, and have very limited access to technology so that will be the next challenge uh, for the advice sector in scotland and that's it from me but i thank you again for for having for having me speak on behalf of rebecca but laura stroke rebecca thank you very much indeed and you're you're right to mention there the tech issues we've had today, but the um, the name of the game going forward will be sticking at it and sticking at it together. And um, a, a, as we do, a, a things will uh, um, improve and get um, stronger and stronger. Uh, re really grateful for your contribution. Um, and um, in a few moments, we're going to take a five minute break and then the breakout sessions will begin. Uh, 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 I know that there um, uh, was oversubscription to some of the breakouts. Again, please bear with that. Um, uh, 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 it, it's bound to um, reinforce the, um, um, the the overall success of the afternoon. That interest levels were were so high. After those breakouts, we won't be coming back into a plenary gathering. And so it is for me now just to say one or two uh, final um, words. Uh, the first is um, 
what an experience today has been. The first of these forums or fora was in the bunker at 1 Victoria Street, which has recently been used day in, day out by uh, uh, Monsieur Barnier um, uh, uh, for the Brexit negotiations. Um, and um, then we moved to Central Hall, Westminster. Um, all being well, we'll be there with technology along our side next year. Thank you to the team. Thank you to the team that behind the scenes has made today possible. To Graham, to Lee, to Sam, to Grace, to Rachel, to Amy, and to Matt and the team at Amplitude. Thank you in advance to those who are leading the breakout sessions this afternoon. And from every one of us, thank you so much for supporting today and for the work in the year ahead. From the Civil Justice Council, every best wish.